Welcome to season four of my podcast, Between Us, Stories of Unconscious Bias. I've added the title Between Us, as I thought Stories of Unconscious Bias alone was a little too remote. My hope was that the podcast would feature honest and personal stories that raise awareness and educate. Between Us, as a main title, underlines the intimacy while reinforcing the sense of our collective involvement. Since launching it in early May 2020, the world has again changed. George Floyd died, and Black Lives Matter, which had started in 2013, has become more popular and more widely accepted. Identity politics and culture wars have deepened in the UK and the US. Meanwhile, in other countries, people are being marginalized for their religion and beliefs. The need to understand the subject of unconscious bias has taken on ever more meaning and resonance. As always, I am so grateful to all my wonderful speakers who share their often brave stories and allow us to understand the nuances of this very important subject. Thank you for listening. Dr. Yan Wang Preston, is a British Chinese artist interested in the connections between landscape, ecology, identity, and migration. She has specialized in conducting long term projects that are demanding both physically and intellectually. For example, she photographed the entire 6,211 kilometer Yangtze River in China at precise 100 kilometer intervals for her Mother River project. Yan has published two photo books Mother River and Forest with Hatje Kants. She holds a PhD in photography and currently lectures at the University of Huddersfield. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, Smita, for inviting me. So, Jan, I'd, I'd love to know what you understand by unconscious bias, those two words. What does that mean to you? <laughs> I think I first heard of the term perhaps a year ago. Um, it does um, make me think so uh, I checked some Google definition, but my understanding perhaps, you know, first of all, is an unconscious bit, something you don't realize that's in you. And bias, my understanding, is, you know, is not neutral, is it? It's potentially um, a perception of something that's not entirely true. I love that. Uh, and you're and you're absolutely right because it's a perception um, which may or may not be enti- not entirely true. But mm-hmm. what you didn't say, which I love, is the fact that you don't talk about it as a positive or a negative. Uh, that is just not entirely true. And of course, unconscious meaning you you don't know. So so what does that then look like for you, Yan? Um, <laughs> can you tell us a little bit more about yourself and and the context of what this idea of unconscious bias means to you? Okay. Um, what can I say about myself? I'm British Chinese. Uh, that means um, in my um, context, I was born and raised in China. I came to Britain when I was 29 years old. So fully grown as a Chinese person. And now I have a British passport. So I suppose I could say a lot of um, the things I consider are probably considered from, we would say, both Chinese and slightly British <laughs> perspectives, and hopefully more than just that. Um, yeah, I mean, it reminds me of me because I'm, I'm exactly like you. I'm British Indian and I grew up in India and I came and the phrase I use is fully formed, whatever that means. But you said fully grown and I'm wondering what that looks like, you know, how does that impact on you? Um, what that impacts on me is, a, is an interesting one <laughs> um, because that's, I can say I realized recently that all these years I have been trying to unlearn what I have learned. Uh, throughout the years of growing up in China. And that means to put ideas from both sides in perspective in reference to each other. Okay, yeah, which, which means up. what? No, I mean, I'm just fascinated <laughs> by what you're saying, but I, I just want a little bit more understanding on that. What does that mean? What does that look like? <laughs> um, let me give you an example. Recently, 
I was making an art piece. Well, I, I, I hope it's an art piece. I've been cutting some dead flowers open. Um, while doing that, I thought, hmm, what does this, what does this mean to me? What, what um, does it make me feel and think in this process of doing something that's actually completely ridiculous, you know, cutting some dead flowers open? But uh, what made me think was this, I felt a very bitter pleasure in betraying my father because he wanted me to be a surgeon and here I am being a surgeon, you know, cutting flowers open very precisely and carefully, but obviously not the surgeon he wanted me to be. And with that, I realized, you know, as a person, we grow up in society, um, but that society perhaps uh, boils down to the family surrounding as a core. So to somehow realize what my family wanted um, for me or from me, and to consciously say that, you know what, I'm not giving you that. That that's taken me 44 years to realize, OK, the society, first of all, is my father, not my mother. My father is, a, you know, as they say, it's a patriarchal society. And that's making me think, right, OK, I keep my family name as my father's surname. I gave my daughter a name with her father's surname. And we're all playing that part of uh, following some conventions uh, of the society based on the patriarchal society. But that's the case in China and the United Kingdom and in India and most parts of the world uh, continue to have a patriarchal society. So what makes China different? What makes you feel that your instinct or your unconscious biases now need to be unlearned? <laughs> um, is China really different? I don't know, because, you know, in England, we, we normally take the father's surname anyway. But um, on the smaller level, I observe um, how families behave here and for how family operate over there. And perhaps on a certain level in China, we do unconditionally ask for absolute obedience from the children in the family. And you can say this is a family of three people or four people, and you can say that's family of 1.6 billion people. Absolute obedience, no question. You do what you are told to do, and you should not think for yourself. On one level, that's a good thing, um, you know, for example, when COVID happens, everybody was wearing masks in China, obeying rules, no question there. But obviously, um, I suppose for society to somehow operate, you still need some independent thinking. That's really interesting. And, and But also when you say family, now um, correct me if I'm wrong, but China has had a one-child policy for a very, very long time. Uh, and it's only quite recently that has begun to change. So does that mean that all these families, the 1.2 billion people, are all, you know, mostly, not all, mostly parents with one child, and the child has to be, you know, be obedient no matter what. And yeah. therefore, there's also another connection about what family means, because most children don't have siblings. So mm -hmm. what does that look like in terms of family? Um, well... Luckily, I, I have a sibling. I was born just before the one-child policy came in. So I can't really say for um, the, family, the families with, with only one child. Um, we, in China, we, we do say, you know, the one-child policy generation, those children, um, do behave slightly, or I shall say quite differently, um, from the previous generations. 
I think, you know, the, the fact that these children are so precious has led to perhaps a distorted way of raising up these children. They are the absolute king or queen in their family, whatever they say. So it's, it's really strange. On one level, it's whatever they say. But at the same time, the families, the families still would like to have the obedience. That means they need to respect their father, or they need to remain loyal to the family, and so on. So it, it's, it's quite strange that the children are squeezed in between these two extremes. That's fascinating. Because I'm thinking about, you know, unconscious bias and how our, uh, you know, generations of cultural norms, society and cultural norms can impact on on us. So, so something that happened, uh, something that is expected in terms of behavior 200 years ago still continues today and we don't realize it. And then we, re, you know, kind of keep perpetuating uh, ways of behavior is, is what I'm thinking based on what you're saying. But then, strangely, because of the one-child policy, there's been a little bit of a, a, a clash, which, so in some ways, am I misunderstanding? In some ways, do you think it would have been easier for you if you were one child? I'm just kind of wondering, thinking aloud, um, where the, 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 you know, the patriarchy and the father's, whatever he says, has to be followed. You wouldn't have had to fight as hard as you did if you were the only child. I think you you still will. Um, I've been thinking about this um, quite a lot um, for this interview. Perhaps instead of talking about um, one child policy and the impact, um, we can talk a little bit more on how a Chinese woman um, is expected to behave unconsciously. Please. <laughs> No, I, I, I mean, I, that would be very interesting learning for all of us. Yes, yeah. please, yeah. I think a society, you know, functions on, on. I think a lot of it is on its traditions, you know, that that are established over thousands of years. So if we look at China's long history over these thousands of years, and women are always. Um, at you know, at the best secondary. <laughs> um, so their role is to be obedient to the husband. Um, traditionally, a good woman in China perhaps uh, should be the one who stays at home. And I I heard this um, story about earrings. <clears throat> so apparently. I don't know if it's true, but if a woman wears a pair of long earrings, when she turns her head, her face will get slapped by the earrings. And that reminds us she should not turn her head. Very often she should keep, you know, a quite steady uh, position. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, that, that um, <laughs> belief of how a woman should be is always there. I don't know if you heard recently, his, we had a historical um, uh, court rule in China recently. When a couple got divorced, the husband was ordered to pay his wife a certain amount of money for all the housework she has done over the years. And that's a woman's default rule. Uh, rule in the house, yes, to do the housework, to stay at home, to, you know, to educate the children. So I think that that role of a woman always is there. It's always in us. It doesn't matter if we're modern women. But at the same time, you know, through the last 100 years of China's modernization, um, particularly, you know, as part of uh, the Communist Party's uh, policy, for example, Chairman Mao once said, uh, women can support half of the sky. And, you know, you could think that this was part of the strategy to win, let's say, votes or supports. They didn't have mm. votes, but support from people. Mm. So, you know, women probably... Um, 
were making up half of the population. So therefore, it's, it's important to motivate them. And during, during the Cultural Revolution, again, um, because women are supposed to be as strong as men, so, you know, a, a generation of very strong women grew up, including people like my mother. She was um, kind of the leader of their red soldier um, gang <laughs> at right. the time. Um, so, you know, you have a generation of very strong women educated to lead the revolution. But at the same time, the other side of the society's expectation stays in them in the way that they are still expected to be secondary, to be the support of the family, the individual family, not the leaders, and child policy. So can you imagine if this girl born as only child in her family? So she carries all these, and plus she's the only child. So, um, so what that means is you now have a lot of I think a lot of very strong Chinese women and they have been taught to be perfect and they they are supposed to be very very good at work but also very very good in the house <laughs> hmm. you know how is that going to work out um, I, I, <laughs> there is a joke yeah in China Mm -hmm. It says, there are only three types of people in the world. One is men, one uh, is uh, women, the other one is women PhDs. <laughs> I know, what, and what does that mean then in terms of these women monsters. PhDs? Monsters. <laughs> we are supposed to be monsters. So if you are a woman PhD, no man would want to marry you because you're too clever. So, so essentially, what, what, because to me, I'm hearing unconscious biases, not just in China, but say, all over the world, you will hear the same story. Um, but yet, it's to you a very Chinese way of living where, and, and I'm sure you're right, but it doesn't necessarily take away from the fact that you will see something similar where men are threatened by women because they present themselves to be clever, high achieving, confident women, um, the equivalent of the PhD. <laughs> exactly. So unfortunately, I am a woman PhD. <laughs> <laughs> and what does that do then when you're in China? <laughs> uh, luckily, I married myself off before I became a PhD. <laughs> I have to laugh, I, but but uh, no, but seriously though, because uh, mm. also I think by your surname, which I'm assuming is your married surname, so you there you were, you followed the patriarchal route and you took your husband's surname. Am I correct? I took his name um, mainly because it would just make my life quite a lot easier in Britain. Although my Chinese surname is W A N G, for me it's that easy. It's mm. still not very easy, actually, to many people. And I think unconsciously, there is this pressure uh, to confirm I'm here. I might as well, you know, have a, a British surname to make me feel more part of the society here. Right. Perhaps we should we should talk a little bit about that and what that looks like. I mean, I am just so interested in hearing all your stories, Yan. So, you know, you've talked to us a little bit about uh, about China and the, the culture and the cultural revolution uh, and what that looked like in terms of women and women's empowerment. And then, of course, age 29, you arrived in the United Kingdom, um, fully formed, fully grown. This is who I am. Mm -hmm. This is my sense of who I see, my how I see myself. And then what? Can you can you tell us a little bit more? Um, I suppose the first thing I should say is I personally have not really experienced 
racism here in a very bad way. Um, because a lot of people would be, you know, wanting to know, oh, uh, she's, she's Chinese, she's living here. Um, but that doesn't mean that my Chinese friends um, haven't experienced anything either. Um, what, what does it look like for me to live here? If I go back to this identity of being a Chinese woman without realizing that, then um, when I came here, I realized in the last 15, 16 years, it's, it's a gradual realization of my own unconscious bias of trying to be perfect, trying to be this woman who puts on dinner on the table, puts dinner on the table at the right time for everyone, but also who appears beautiful, um, intelligent, all those things. And only a few years ago, through actually through the exposure of um, feminism movements here, I have begun to ask myself, why? Why do I want to be perfect? Uh, is it because men want me to be like this? Or is it is this from my own um, kind of standards? And where did these standards come from? So actually, from quite a few years back, my New Year ref resolution to myself has stayed the same. Try not to be perfect. Try That's not very moving. That's very, very moving, Jan. And I, and I, you know, because I think women around the world will completely connect with you. Um, because I think a lot of women, however much we try to be following the feminist movement and wanting to, you know, be ourselves and be confident in ourselves, all strive and work hard to be whatever perfect might look like. You know, in China, it looks like this particular way and in, in other parts of the world, it may look different. But this idea of looking actually physically beautiful, um, doing well in the home, making sure everything is perfect. Plus, of course, uh, you know, especially if you have children, then how do you take care of your children? It, it, will, st it will strike a chord with, with many women around the world, um, not just in China. And, and I just wanted to say that. So I appreciate you sharing that. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that. So, um, yeah, this kind of route to, <laughs> to achieve at least the self-realization, I think that perhaps is a, a process of finding your own unconscious bias. You know, for example, a couple of years back, I was commissioned by Open Eye Gallery in Liverpool to do um, a portrait project on Chinese students in Britain. So that year I decided to photograph male students. And I designed a question to start this process. And the question was, what makes you a man? And <laughs> I'm smiling, yes. <clears throat> exactly. So in the end, after talking to eight students, male students in depth, I began, I really began to ask myself, how on earth did I even ask that question? What, what makes you a man? So unconsciously, I already had, had ideas of uh, what a man ought to be in that question. <laughs> so uh, surprisingly, the boys told me in the end, I think our collective uh, con conclusion was um, gender is fluid. They, they understood what the society wants them as a man, but none of them felt that they, they fitted into that man. But this was because you were talking to students, so I'm talking average age what, 20 something, 22, yes. 23, yes. And, and that I think is, it needs to be flagged up uh, because um, I find that today's younger generation in their 20s, man and woman born, you know, assigned the gender of a man or a boy or a girl at birth. 
are, are far more fluid about how they see themselves and how they connect with others. But I wonder if you had asked the same question to, I don't know, um, 20 Chinese men living in the United Kingdom, age 50, what would they have answered? I'm just thinking aloud. Um, would that have been very different, I wonder? I think it will be very different. They will be molded <laughs> <laughs> into that man. So, you know, it, the thing is, when I ask that question, what, what makes you a man? And in the end, that question would come back to myself. So what makes myself a woman then? And what is uh, my perception of a woman? You know, for example, if um, we had we had a pair of friends, the woman was a kind of a workaholic, and the man was um, more kind of home orientated, shall we say? So, as friends, we were quite concerned when she was traveling a lot and leaving him with two young children. The thing is, if we reverse the situation, if the man <laughs> was traveling quite a lot for work and leaving the woman at home with two young children, nobody would raise her eyes. Exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm nodding away in agreement. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, this unconscious bias, it, it, it's everywhere in our psyche, I think. But by talking about it, I feel, um, you know, there are more chances of bring, bring them into the surface, shall we say. Yes, it's about dismantling it, isn't it? And, then that, and you are so right, Jan, because this is about, you know, your upbringing and who you are is so deeply ingrained in you, as in me or as in any one of us who's listening to this podcast or this interview. That, you know, how we are, how we grow up, what is our narrative, what's our story, what's our life story. And then we fall into default mode about how we should behave. Certainly, uh, you know, in your regard about your father has to be the right, you know, he cannot be questioned, he cannot be argued with what he says is right. Um, and the fact that you had the bravery to, to, to break away from that and, and be a different kind of surgeon, cut flowers rather than bodies. Um, all of these things are so ingrained in us, which is why you're, the phrase you used, you're unlearning, aren't you? And that's exactly what we need to do about unconscious bias. You have to unlearn. But, but, but to, to, I mean, could you share another story perhaps, Jan? You mean my, my own un unconscious bias? Or, or somebody else's perhaps that you have witnessed or you've experienced? <laughs> well, I think um, generally speaking, people are quite subtle. So um, if they do have anything towards me, I wouldn't know <laughs> um, most of the time. But, um, you know, there are times, for example, when, when people see my work you know i'm a photographer i'm an artist so for one of my um projects it's quite a um, ambitious project physically um is to photograph the entire Yangtze river every 100 kilometers and the river is 6211 kilometers long mm. so i remember there were voices i.e oh um that little girl she traveled quite far this was a comment made by a male Chinese photographer. That little girl, she traveled quite far for my project was, well, A, I'm not a little girl. B, so what? Cannot a little girl travel very far? So they, he completely dismissed the project. Based on your gender? Yeah. Hmm. It sounds like I'm just playing. And, you know, back to Britain, I, it's funny, once I went to a um, portfolio review, and uh, this time it's probably not unconscious, it's even conscious. So the reviewer, the first thing he said to me was, oh, women don't do these kind of things. Only blokes will go that far to do this. Wow. Wow. But what's also interesting, though, is something else that you said, and I just want to kind of flag that up. Mm. This this uh, idea of, you know, 
the fact that you arrived in this country from China in your 20s and therefore with a very strong sense of your identity and so, and these are my words, not yours, and I'm kind of throwing them at you to see how you react. Therefore, you never really felt any experience of racism. Um, maybe there was some sort of odd comment every once in a while, but you didn't really feel that and sense that. And I've thought a lot about that myself, only because similar to you, I grew up and, and came fully formed in my 20s to the United Kingdom. And I wonder what that says about us, you and I, and other people like us who, who emigrated to another country in our 20s or maybe older, in sense of how we see ourselves. And therefore, we do not see what a lot of people who may have been born in this country would have seen as racism. Am I making sense? I'm you just questioning that. that. Yeah. I think that's a really <clears throat> interesting and important question. You know, someone ought to look into this because um, last day I did quite a lot of interviews uh, with BBCs, British-born Chinese. So they are different. Uh, they were born here and educated here. And they all had a lot of bad experiences. All of them. Uh, I think perhaps, for example, you grew up in India, I grew up in China, you know, in China, um, we, we, we probably have this racist problem, but uh, I belong to the majority <laughs> of the race, so I could not see that. And also, growing up there for so long, I think I already have a very strong sense of who who I was before I came here and the friends I interviewed a lot of them were first generation British born Chinese so they had this double pull, pulling the family would tell them they were Chinese and they went to school they were eating noodles their friends were eating sandwiches for lunch <laughs> And they, they felt different from this young age. So from a very young age, they had to negotiate the, you know, the differences. And we probably did not have to do that. Not in because, the same. Because of what you said, because we have, we were very comfortable in ourselves. We know who we are. Whereas when you're five or six or seven or 10 or 15, you want to fit in. Exactly. Uh, and if I'm taking noodles to school and, and you're bringing sandwiches or whichever, the other way around, whatever, mm. I, 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 don't, I, I don't fit in. And That's then it. my sense of self has been affected. Yes. And so, of course, visually, if you're Chinese or if you're Indian born, I mean, ethnicity, you, you stand out. I mean, obviously, you look different from the local white British person, whatever that looks like. You know what I mean? Whereas yeah. there could be perhaps somebody who is Russian. Yes, um, who who arrives here at the age of seven, who mm. may not have those concerns because as he grows older, he looks like an English boy. Exactly. And also, I think the whole education thing, for example, this BBC One, he calls himself BBC One, British born right. and he's first generation. <laughs> and <laughs> so, um, you know, he said, OK, growing up in the English school, History lesson was the worst for him because in the history lesson, and they were taught the British beat the Chinese, the Asians, blah, blah, blah. So he, at, he actually felt ashamed being Chinese because his motherland, well, one of his motherlands, shall we say, was beaten. But that was a message that that was a history lesson he received. I'm hoping things are a bit different now because my daughter's going to the English school here and I'm already telling her stories of, of the opium war just to get her ready because yes. there are two stories, not just one. Exactly. Exactly. And I'm glad for that. But I mean, this is just um, just so interesting because I could keep talking with you, Yan. Uh, sharing these ideas of culture and difference. But uh, I'm wondering whether you could perhaps share an, a, another story about yourself 
uh, maybe in China growing up as a little child, because I just want to take us back there because so many of us, I've certainly never been to China and maybe many of the listeners have never been to China. Mm -hmm. I just want to get a little bit more of, of that flavor and that understanding. And you said you were part of the larger community. What does that even mean? Can you explain that? <laughs> that um, because China actually has many uh, ethnic groups. Uh, I think we have about 56 mes uh, ethnic minority groups. And the majority uh, um, ethnic group is called Han people. I I can't remember oh, yes. the exact, yeah, exact number, maybe like 98%. Most of us are of Han people. So, you know, the Chinese story perhaps is told more from the Han people's perspective. You know, for example, the Tibetans will have a very different story. Um, but uh, my personal story, I, I, I suddenly remember this. This was quite interesting. So when I was in the high school, I fancied a boy. <laughs> um, so the first time I held hands with, uh, with a boy in my life, this is, you know, after childhood years, yeah, and teenage years, um, I was shaking, I was so excited. I was shaking all over. <laughs> you know, just standing in the corridor, you know, as teenagers, <laughs> having a chat. And he told me about the ox that his family owned. At that moment, I felt disgusted. And that, that's because at that moment, I realized he and I belong to very uh, different social classes. My parents were doctors. I never realized that before, but we were led to believe that we were better than peasants. And uh, his family had all, you know, cows and ox. So, you know, he's, he's from a peasant family. So I think that incident, the fact that I felt disgusted, kind of woke me up up a little bit and that realization that I placed myself in an elite of so uh, uh, you know a group of social elite that became a lot a lot more obvious when I came to Britain I, I know people say the class system here is still there um, but it works slightly differently because in China I think traditionally we have one group of people. Um, they are the so-called, uh, you know, the educated um, intellectuals, and they are the people who will get all the um, official jobs. They are the people who live in cities and receiving all the, um, you know, social privileges. And they are basically the ruling class. And then you have people who trade, who do business. And the worst could be people who farm. Um, and that continues to today? It's slightly different today. Because in one way, there are a lot of Chinese people who are not educated in that same way, but they, they have money now. Um, but I think deep down in the society, this is still there. The, the easiest way for someone to change their destiny is to have really good results in the exams and go to a really good university. That still is the most important gateway. That's fantastic. Um, that's really good learning for all of us on Chinese society. But mm -hmm. so, Jan, when you know, you've been here now for 14, 15 years, yes. um, you've obviously been thinking about aspects of unconscious bias. So how do you manage your own unconscious biases? I think um, I'm, I'm hoping that gradually 
I'm becoming more self-reflective as a person. You know, I think being an artist, a lot of our job is to find our um, pre-existing beliefs, shall I say. I'm not even saying it's an unconscious bias, but, you know, why did I make this work? Why did I take that picture? Why did I uh, not take the other picture? What was the picture in my mind? So, you know, all these were there. So we have learned to question ourselves quite a lot. So I suppose it's just one of those things. We um, ask questions and um, we stand on guard. You know, for example, years ago, I met someone who's rather large. And I think at the time I had this thing of, you know, large people are by definition um, not very self-disciplined. Otherwise, how do we, how do they get that size? Blah, blah. But actually, since meeting that person, I read she, she, she is just as bubbly and as intelligent as a lot of us. Her size has got nothing to do with, you know, how she actually is or how, um, or how she is. It's, it's my prejudice. Mm. And um, so, you know, that's another lesson to learn. But I think once I realize that, I try to kind of uh, keep an eye on it, shall we say. I don't think we can forever um, achieve neutrality or objectivity. You know, that's almost impossible and perhaps um, it's not desired. But um, we can keep an eye on things. Of course you can. Wise, wise words. And of course, we don't want to, to be neutral, but it is, I think, wonderful to be able to just reflect and, and challenge and possibly unlearn. Yeah. Jan, Jan Wong Preston, thank you so very much for sharing your stories of unconscious bias. Well, thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's been an interesting process to think about this and to think about how to talk on these issues. Thank you. Well, thank you, Smita. Thank you for listening to my podcast, Between Us, Stories of Unconscious Bias. I'm Smitha Tharoor. If you like this episode, please do share with a friend or colleague. It's only by sharing that more people will know of it. You can find out about previous episodes and the next ones by following me on Twitter or Instagram at Smitha Tharoor. The next episode will be in a week's time.